Thank you again, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, we're going to talk about Frontier. And for those of us that work for Frontier, it's one of our favorite topics, right? Getting to know new students and share what it is that we do to help um, produce nurse practitioners and primary care providers. So we're super excited to be here. Thank you for spending some time with us so that we can um, share what we do. And this is being recorded. So if uh, it will be available for those who wanted to attend but couldn't. And again, if you have your camera available and it's working, we'd like for you to share it with us so that we can see you um, and make some eye contact and get to know you a little bit. So welcome to our family nursing Q&A session. Um, I am Dr. Audra Cave. I'm the chair of the Department of Family Nursing. And I'm super excited to introduce you also to Dr. Vicki Stone Gale who is an associate professor and one of our course coordinators here at Frontier. She teaches in one of the management courses, so she'll be able to share her wisdom with us tonight. We're also joined by some other Frontier representatives. Uh, Stephanie Boyd is here tonight, and she's going to help give some information about the clinical um, program and how we can help prepare you for that. And I believe we have someone from admissions here tonight. Is that correct? I am here. Yep. I'm Bobby Linderman. I'm from admissions. So, yep, I'm here to help as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. It's good to see you. All right. So we're going to dive right in. Um, we like to start off by telling you a little bit about why we are here and what our purpose is. Our purpose is to prepare family nurse practitioners to care for families who reside in rural and underserved areas, which you'll hear a lot in our mission statements. And really what we believe is that um, the rural and underserved areas uh, are, are our focus and we do like to um, rep represent them and support them in their healthcare needs and primary care. We offer this on a structured off-campus community-based um, FNP specialty track, and we will talk about that a little bit more um, as we go along here. And I am going to turn this over to Dr. Stone Gale, and she'll tell you a little bit about some of the thing, other things that are really important to us at Frontier. Hi, good evening and welcome. We're so excited to see all of you here tonight so we can give you some really good insight as to Frontier Nursing University and what we do here. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about the culture of caring and that is something that's really important to us at Frontier. The culture of caring fosters institutional success and growth and integrity and there are five different elements that we look at in the culture of caring. One is professionalism, the other is inclusivity, respect, positive communication, and mutual support. And those are the five um, definitions that we use. And by fostering the, the uh, culture of caring, we do believe that our FN community will grow, we will succeed, we will prosper, and we will be involved in a very safe and supportive and happy environment. And we really do strive for this at Frontier. So you'll hear us talk a lot about, if you do come into the program, you're going to hear us talk a lot about the culture of caring uh, throughout your program. Uh, using your community as a classroom, you know, this is something that sometimes people struggle with because many of you may have done a face-to-face -face, um, bachelor's program. Some of you may have done an online bachelor's program, but you're, you're using, you're really using your home and your community as a classroom and you're able to study from the comforts of your home. And that's one of the things that we do uh, like about Frontier is that we have an excellent online program and the faculty in the program, even though you know, you're doing it from your home, they are there for you. They're very involved with you. Um, they have a lot of presence in the classroom with you. And so you're not left alone. You're not just handed. Uh, a, a module and said, go, go work on this and, and take the test and, and we'll see you and have a nice day. That's not how we work. We, we are very involved with the students in our courses. We're very involved as far as our presence there to make you feel welcome, to, to answer questions, to be there if you need any 
support. And so even though you're studying from your home, um, you know, we are there for you all the time. And you will get to travel to our campus in Versailles, Kentucky for orientation and for workshops. And what we do is um, when you come to Kentucky, it's called Frontier Bound. Frontier Bound is when you come in to be oriented to the program and to the university. And so you come to the campus for two and a half days. You get to meet faculty who are assigned to be there with you for that day. Uh, those days that you're there and we work walk you through what the history of frontier is what your coursework is going to be like what it's going to be like to develop a community what what you're going to it's going to be like to develop relationships with other students who are with you at the campus and you've never met before and when you leave there you're going to have some really lifelong lasting friendships in um, in the community of frontier so you'll also go back again to do what we call clinical bound, which is where you, we go to prepare you for your clinical experiences. When you go to frontier uh, to clinical bound, you are going to be um, doing simulations with patients. You're going to be learning how to do um, musculoskeletal exams and GU exams, mental health exams, many different things that we do simulations with. And you're going to do physical examinations and you're going to really, we're going to see then how you're prepared to go out in the clinical setting with your preceptor so that you are able to um, function in, the, in that role. And we know that you're safe to go out and do that. Um, next slide, please. So we have over 80 years of experience in our graduate nursing and midwifery education and our midwifery program started many, many years ago in the 1920, I believe 1926. And our family nursing program followed. Um, this is one of the first family nursing programs in the country. And we have really prospered over the years. Our alumni are all over the, um, all over the country. We have students and alumni in, in all of the uh, United States. We do even have them abroad in some countries. And we have 2,500 currently enrolled students and over 8,000 graduates. So you can see we have a very big database of students. Our um, alumni do precept students, which is very nice. If you go out to the clinical site, usually it's somebody who's been at Frontier. Um, it, and it doesn't have to be, but we have so many alumni that do represent us and do take on the students to be precepted. So we have a very large student population. We try to not make our classes so huge, though. And some of the primary co uh, courses, like, you know, your advanced farm and advanced patho and, and physical assessment, those are a little larger courses. And when you get into the management courses, they're a little uh, hone down because you're really going into your track. So it really depends on what your what track you're going into. Next slide. So we are very proud at Frontier for some of the achievements we have. Um, we have received an International Distance Learning Award presented by the U United States Distance Learning Association. And that was in, in uh, November of 2021. We are very proud of that. We're also proud that we are one of the top uh, great colleges to work for in the United States. And we have dedicated faculty and staff, and that is the reason for us being able to say that it is one of the greatest colleges to work for. Many of our faculty are Frontier graduates, so they have been through the program. They know what you're facing. Um, some of us are not. I'm not a Frontier graduate. Dr. Cave is a Frontier graduate. but. Um, we are able to give you so much expertise, um, if whether we are or we're not, and we have great faculty, we have wonderful staff, we have a wonderful IT department, um, uh, we have a wonderful admissions department, and a, a wonderful every department, I have to say. Uh, I've been at Frontier for almost 10 years now, it'll be 10 years next month, and I have not regretted one day of working and, uh, and not, you know, I've had the support of every part of uh, Frontier the whole time I've been here. So it is one of the greatest colleges to work for. The other thing that we're very, very proud is, is that we are a national leader in DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we are the six time winner of the Insight into Diversity, Higher Education, Excellence in Diversity Heat Award. And that is really 
a very, very high honor for a university to receive this. So we really look at um, very strongly at DEI in our university. We have a DEI committee, we have DEI fellows, um, and we have a lot of support from administration for DEI in, in uh, Frontier. And I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Kate. Thank you, Dr. Stonegale. A few more of our achievements, the first FNP program in 1970, uh, we celebrated our FNP department celebrated their 50th anniversary in 2020. And one of the things that we are very proud of is our pass rate. Our board pass rate overall is 95%. Um, and you won't find that in, in a lot of other schools. So that's one of the things that you really want to look at when you're thinking about uh, what school to go to for your graduate degree. Um, the pass rate is... Uh, is something that we're very proud of. Student support. Um, look at this list of people who are here to support you. You have regional clinical faculty. These are your faculty members who will guide you through the clinical practicum. Um, all of them are doctorally prepared and they're experts in um, their region and their uh, clinical practice. So they're clinically practicing doctorally prepared faculty who are going to be with you through your entire clinical practicum, helping guide you through that. We have uh, expert clinical preceptors. I think Stephanie's going to be able to tell you a little bit more about our preceptor database, but we um, have a large database of preceptors and many of them have worked with us for a long time. They, they are they prefer many times frontier students because frontier students come to them very prepared and ready to start their clinical program. We have academic advisors and clinical advisors. So the academic advisor is in a position to help guide you through your coursework up until you get to clinical. They help you determine which classes to take and help you maybe um, address any challenges along the way. So, so you will be assigned an academic advisor who will follow you through the program from start to finish. We also have clinical advisors. Um, Stephanie will tell you a little bit more about this, but the clinical advisor is again assigned to you from the very beginning. And their role is to help guide you through the process of getting ready for clinicals, making sure that you get your sites and your preceptors um, and um, very valuable resource to our students. We have online student mentoring groups that you'll be able to sign up for should you choose to do so. And this is students who uh, are a little further along in the program and they will help uh, sort of mentor you through those first few terms. We have financial aid and scholarships available for our students. We have a wonderful online library with librarians who are itching to help um, all of us. Uh, excellent library. And then as Dr. Stone Gale said, we have our Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which is really threaded through um, our entire program. So lots of opportunity to not only explore diversity, equity, and inclusion, but to also um, reap the benefits of a university that looks at education through an equity lens. Our scholarships are available in your spring and fall cycles. Um, you do have to have com completed, completed 24 credits uh, with FNU. So generally these scholarships become available as you're getting ready to go into clinical. Uh, the minimum GPA for the scholarships is 3.25 or higher. Uh, we have over 20 scholarships available. And look at this, in 2022, we were able to award over $700,000 in scholarships to our students. And one little known fact is that a lot of those, some, some of that scholarship money comes from our preceptors. They donate it back to the university in order to um, help students along to keep going. So they feel so compelled by the program that they want to um, share and, and give back to the students. So I think that speaks highly for our program. And then I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie Boyd to talk a little bit about the Clinical Outreach and Placement Department.
Sorry, I wouldn't come off mute. Good evening, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, again, I'm Stephanie Boyd. I'm the director of the Clinical Outreach and Placement Services Department. We are a student support services uh, unit here at the university, and we are here to help students from the time they come to Frontier Bound uh, through their program build and develop an appropriate clinical plan. And that clinical plan uh, is essentially an electronic list of all the sites and all the preceptors um, that you will be working with when you're ready to start your clinical experience and your clinical coursework. What that really means is we are a support service. Our clinical advisors are here to be able to meet with you individually in group advising sessions. Um, and um, sometimes we do some like larger um, sessions with the regional clinical faculty to help you understand how to use the resources at Frontier. Thanks to our alumni network, um, we have many, many sites and preceptors in a clinical da database. Once you become a student at Frontier, you have access to that database and you are able to really build a clinical plan uh, that speaks to you. So you really individualize that plan, of course, working within the parameters and the requirements um, that we have, which you can find in our catalog. But um, we will we probably won't touch on all those details today, but our clinical advisors are assigned to you when you come into the program and you have the ability to call on them at any time to help you build your plan. Of all of our students that come into the program, about a third upon admission know exactly where they want to do their clinical hours, and they're ready to really start that process right away. About a third of our students are sort of sure, but they really don't have a yes from a preceptor or a site yet, so we help kind of develop that uh, that relationship with the student and potential sites and preceptors. And then a third of our students come in and they don't really know at all where they where they might be doing their clinical experience and they need some additional support. So the clinical advisor will sit down and work with you and use that database to really um, identify appropriate sites and appropriate preceptors. Once once you kind of pin down or know who you're going to work with and you get that yes, um, you as a student are the one that will be reaching out to the sites and the preceptors that are available to you. You'll work the details out with them and then submit paperwork uh, digitally to our credentialing department. And that credentialing department is here to do all the contract, all the credentialing, all the onboarding for all your sites and preceptors. You as a student don't have to worry about doing that. We also have a clinical site coordinator who works with um, my team. Her name is Brittany, and she is like the concierge service for all of our incoming and existing preceptors to make sure they have all of their questions answered. So sometimes students will approach a preceptor and talk with them about precepting, um, and they still have more questions. So our team can talk directly to that preceptor to help answer those questions and hopefully get them right on board uh, and, and get them ready for you when you're ready to come to clinical. So it, that's the great part about Frontier. You have a lot of support, a lot of resources, but you're able to really customize your clinical plan uh, to really uh, you know, make, it, make it exciting for you and to hopefully really flexible you know there's a lot of flexibility within that plan and we talk with you about that so we are here to work with you and um i'll put my email address our unit's email address here in the chat so if you have follow-up questions after today we're happy to answer any of those if it's about clinical site identification look like uh, uh and preceptors we're happy to talk with you about that during the application process as well Thank you, Stephanie. And here you can see um, some of the degree options that we offer. So we offer the MSN, um, and that's sort of the entry point for the FNP. We also have a postgraduate certificate degree option, and that would be for those students who already have an advanced practice nursing degree in another population focus. So it might be women's health or psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner who's coming back, or even a certified nurse midwife who's coming back to school to get the FNP um, certification as well. We also offer a DNP program, Doctor of Nursing Practice. Um, 
the direct admission, is that still current? Yes, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, we'll have admissions speak to that a little bit more. Do you wanna to add to that now? Yeah, sure. So for the direct admission um, process, you um, basically that's for students that you're finishing your MSN or your postgraduate certificate at Frontier um, and you know that you want to go straight into the DNP program. So rather than having to like go through the regular application process and all of that, um, you can just apply to do direct admit and just go straight to the DNP program rather than, um, you know, taking time off. Certainly people can take time off and then come back later on. And if that's the case, then they would go through the regular application process, but that direct admission um, is an option for those that know they want to go straight into the DNP program. Thank you, Bobby. We um, offer our courses on 11 week terms, four times a year, and we have a two week break between those terms. Um, so typically it can take two to three years to complete the MSN. Um, if you're coming back for the PGC, it could be one to one and a half years and the DNP time frame is about 18 months. And then Bobby, I'll turn it back over to you to talk about the admissions criteria. Awesome. Okay, so for um, the MSN programs, um, applicants must have a, a bachelor's degree or higher in nursing or an associate's degree in nursing with a bachelor's degree in another field. Um, you must have a current active RN license in the United States with no encumbrances. Um, you have to have at least one year of RN experience by the time you would start the program, so not necessarily during the application process, but by the time you would start the program, um, and then need to have a cumulative GPA of 3.0 or above from your um, highest nursing degree earned. Let's talk about New York. I saw, I think mm -hmm. there's always some questions about New York, and I might need your help with this, Bobby, or Stephanie yep. as well, but due to the New York State regulations, um, we can admit a certain number of students from New York, but they will have to do, in the FMP program, they will have to do their clinicals outside of New York. Is that correct? Yes, that's still correct. Yep, DNP program is not like that because DNP program um, is a, a project done at your place of work. So DNP does not, um, need to follow those regulations for state of New York. But yes, for the MSN and uh, postgraduate certificate programs, um, you can be in the state of New York and do like the, uh, the didactic coursework. You can get licensed in and work in the state of New York, but clinicals cannot be done there. That's a state of New York regulation. Um, so we do get applicants that maybe they are, you know, right there by New Jersey. And so they might um, opt to get licensed in New Jersey so they can do clinicals there. Um, so it's still an option. Um, you just have to be able to do clinicals in another state. Thank you. All right, so for postgraduate certificates, um, again, RN, current active RN license in the United States with no encumbrances, must have a master's or higher degree in nursing, and that must be as an advanced practice nurse. Um, so like nursing education, nursing leadership would not count towards those. You must be an advanced practice nurse. Um, you have to have that 3.0 cumulative GPA from your highest nursing degree, um, usually that master's degree. Um, and then the one year of experience doesn't necessarily apply here um, like it would for the, the MSN program because most people are working um, as NPs at that point. Thank you. And then we've got some application um, deadlines coming up. Um, so currently we are accepting applications for the summer term. Um, those classes would start on July 8th. That application just opened a few weeks ago. So the deadline for that is not until April 3rd. Um, and then starting on April 4th, the application will open up for the uh, fall term. Those classes will start October 7th. And it looks like we might have a wrong date on there. It's actually June 26th is the um, application deadline for the fall, so June 26th. Um, as far as applying, um, it's pretty simple. So you would do the application on the website first. Um, there is a $50 application fee. Um, once you do the application, you an admissions counselor would reach out to you. So there's three of us, myself, Richard, and Tamika. Um, our system lets us know you've done an application. We reach out to you um, and assist you with the rest of the process, um, which includes ordering transcripts. Um, we would have you fill out a proxy form that gives us permission to request your transcripts for you. Um, 
Um, and then the remaining documents you would email back to us in, uh, in admissions. It's a current resume. Um, there's one admissions essay um, and then a copy of your current active licensure if, if possible. Um, if not, we can pull the nurse's report. Um, once we have everything for an application, it gets submitted to the review committee um, and then applicants get a decision through email, usually within about four to five weeks or so. Um, and then tuition currently for the FNP program is $665 per credit hour. Thank you, Bobby. So let's see, I'm going to talk a little bit about the clinical experience in a little bit more detail. So our MSN and PG student, PGC students will be required to get 750 clinical hours. Um, and this, the minimum number of weeks that you're in clinical may change a little bit. Right now it's 16 weeks for the MSN, 14 weeks for the PGC. Um, that will likely change. So I would keep an eye on the catalog for that. The DNP clinical hours is 500. Um, with your clinicals, it, it is competency-based, so you'll need to get the requisite number of hours, but also meet certain visit types within each population. So for the FNP department, we have adult visits and geriatric visits and pediatric visits that you will need to get, and we uh, lay it all out there, and, and you'll know what it is that you need to get, but you have to get your hours plus meet those visit requirements. When we do require experiences across the lifespan um, because it is an FNP program. As you know, Dr. Cave is our department chair of family nursing and she was just appointed to that uh, position at the end of last week. And we we're so excited to have her in that position. We also have course coordinators and course faculty in every course. So for example, I'm the course coordinator for the manage, one of the management courses. And then we have course faculty that work with us underneath the course coordinator that work in the course and, and do uh, some of the assignments and do live um, sessions with students. So you always have a course coordinator and you always will have course faculty. Uh, some courses have only one, one additional course faculty, some have two and three, it just depends on the size of the course. Then you have regional clinical faculty and the regional clinical faculty go to the clinical sites um, with the students or work with the, the uh, preceptors in the clinical site when the students are there. We also have academic advisors and clinical advisors and you will work closely with them when you're doing your transition into clinic or you're do, trying to decide what courses to take every term. So they work very closely with you. If you're having any family issues, any concerns, any problems, your academic advisor is there to help you. We also have a financial aid officer and the financial aid officer will, will work with you through any type of uh, issues you have with financial aid, helping you to obtain it, making sure that the rules are followed for financial aid and that you're taking the amount of courses that you need to be taking to keep your financial aid. And then we have a credentialing coordinator and they are going to be helping you to get credentialed at your clinical sites and make sure that the clinical sites are up and running and doing what they're supposed to do in order for them to be able to accept you as a student. Next slide, please. So I want to tell you a little bit about Versailles campus and it is Versailles, it's not Versailles which we always want to say Versailles, Versailles but we're corrected, it is Versailles. Um, Frontier um, opened their new campus in 2020 and it is absolutely beautiful. This was a previous children's home. So we have a lot of buildings there and we have renovated every single building on the campus. And uh, some of them have really been completely gutted to, and they're all brand new. So um, as you'll see at the top left, that is one of what we call the student dorms, but we call them, what's the word we call them? Student, what's the name of the buildings we call them? Lodge, right? student lodge. 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 Student lodge. So we do call them the student lodge instead of the student dorms. Uh, they're beautiful rooms. So they have bathrooms. They have a little kitchenette in there. Um, and they're really very nicely done for the students and very accommodating while you're on campus. The middle picture here is called the president's house. 
And the president's house is used for, we use it for any type of events that we may need to have, uh, president events, board of director events. And we also bring the students in there when they're on campus so we can have an evening in the president's house, a cheese and wine evening with them and get to know you a little better. On the right side is the Welcome Center. So when you come to Frontier Bound, which I talked to you a little bit about, which is your orientation, you will, um, you will be picked up at the airport by the van and you will be dropped off here at the Welcome Center and you'll go in and get all of the information that you need to while you're on campus. Uh, down on the left bottom is some more, just a really pretty view of the campus and some of the student lodges that you can see in the background. Um, on the right side here, we have, I think that is the Welcome Center. I think that's the back side of the Welcome Center on the other side. And then our Frontier Nursing University sign. So it's a beautiful campus. We have walking trails. Um, it's just a wonderful place to get in some exercise when you have some fr uh, free downtime. Oh, and we have our cafeteria, I'm sorry. That's our dining hall, we call it. We don't like to call it the cafeteria. We call it our dining hall and we have some professional chefs and the food is very, very good. We always have a salad bar. We always have soup. We always have desserts. Those are the most important things. And then we do have nice entrees. <laughs> so, uh, and we have, you know, the, the dining hall is open where you can go in and get snacks and drinks and that type of thing uh, while you're on campus. Next slide. Okay, so this, this is one thing, thank you. This is one of my favorite parts about this presentation when um, we can talk about really what, what life is like as an FNP. So Dr. Stonegale, what are, what are some of the things that you would say are, are your favorite parts about being an FNP? Well, I've been a family nurse practitioner now for 32 years um, in Florida. I'm in, uh, right outside of Fort Lauderdale. And um, when I graduated, there was nobody in the area. We were the first graduating class. There were only five of us in the whole tri-county area. And we had to kind of make our way and develop our way into the role. But we really, I think one of my favorite parts of the role is to be able to see the patients uh, independently, to be able to educate them on their illnesses, manage their care. I think, you know, this, I've gotten so much satisfaction over the years of getting to know my patients and developing relationships with them. And really, um, you know, I hate to say this because I really am dating myself, but, you know, I was I was seeing patients, um, the, one, the one girl was two months old when I started seeing her and I saw her parents and now, then I saw her as an adult and now she just had a baby. And uh, I, don't do, I don't do babies in my practice, but she's had, this ba had a baby. So, you know, I've got a lot of longevity with my patients and I've developed so many wonderful, wonderful relationships with them over the years. Um, and also not just in, you know, in FNP practice, but I also uh, have become very involved with health policy as a nurse practitioner in Florida and um, have worked very hard to get autonomous practice for primary care uh, providers in Florida. And we were able to get controlled substances and um, we're working right now and getting our psych mental health nurse practitioners autonomous practice and We'd love to have full practice authority for all of our nurse practitioners in the state, which may not happen for a long time because we really fight battles here with our uh, medical association. But I have found such um, wonderful colleagues and wonderful avenues to expand out of my office site as a nurse practitioner and got into some legislation. And, and I think it's really opened so many doors for me. Um, and I do lectures now on health policy throughout the state. And um, I also was chair for the Florida Board of Nursing for four years, and I still do their probable cause panel. So my, my role as an FNP wasn't just a role in the clinical setting. It really expanded me out to other avenues to be able to practice and do other things that I wanted to do. Well, and that's a really good answer. I feel like the FNP in particular, you can you can do a lot with that degree. You can specialize in a certain field, say neurology or, or whatever speaks to you, 
you will have the degree to be able to do that. So it's very flexible. And I agree with Dr. Stonegale that the role of the FNP is not just seeing patients, but there's policy and um, population health and so many things that we can be involved in. For me, one of the best things about being an FNP is the same really about being an RN. And it's that contact that we have with patients. Mm -hmm. It's that connection that we make and the difference that we can make when we are able to meet patients where they are and make a difference in their health care. Um, for me, I spent I have spent most of my FNP career working with folks who are either underinsured or uninsured. And, and that uh, speaks to the mission for Frontier, working with underserved populations. And for me, that's just very self-fulfilling. So um, I, I, I think the, um, the, the, there's the, there, the limits are few, right? When you get the degree, you can pretty much, um, within the degree in your state, regulations, you can be very flexible with what it is that you want to do. So now I'm going to open up the floor. I know the chat has been a little bit busy, but let's um, talk a little bit about any questions that you have related to the admissions process. And you're welcome to turn your camera on, turn your microphone on. We can have a conversation and we will also keep an eye on this chat. Um, I have a couple questions for admissions. Go yes. for it, Carrie. Um, my first question, so I'm kind of, I finished my BSN, but it's not conferred until May. Um, so I planned on applying in April because I know it closes by June. Um, what's the difference with using the portfolio versus the BSN with the application? I mean, the main difference is portfolio is typically reserved for um, somebody that doesn't have um, a bachelor's degree in nursing. They've got a bachelor's degree or higher in another field, um, an associate's degree in nursing. Um, so they just they apply with that portfolio. Um, I don't know as far as like application review committee or any I'm not I don't know like what the difference is. If there's like a difference in, you know, the review of the application, I don't know if uh dr cave can speak to that at all i'm not exactly well, I guess sure you still would have to have a bachelor's though yes in something. you have to okay, have a bachelor's that makes regardless sense. yep and then um for the frontier bound dates like i'm just trying to plan my future um the rest of the year um so do you like pick one or do you get assigned one because i saw there were several yep you would get to pick one um whatever ones are still available that aren't full if you get admitted um, that's one of the first things that you would do if admitted um, there's like you get like an email of you know the next steps you know after being admitted and that's one of the very first things you would do is pick from those available dates um, which one you'd like to attend got it and is there a wait list i saw somebody in the chat said that they were on a wait list <laughs> uh, we yep there is a wait list um, we get lots of applicants um, we do rolling admissions so when we receive applications um, they get reviewed instead of you know waiting to an application deadline and reviewing them all they are reviewed as they're received um, so we do have a wait list okay i think that's it thank you thanks Great carrie questions. So there's a question in the chat that somebody wanted to know if there was a way to improve their um, application to reapply for next application cycle to get in and off the wait list. Yeah, I would say one of my my biggest things that I tell people when they ask this question is the example resume. Um, so I don't think a lot of people realize how important of a tool that example resume that's on the website can be. And we also have it available in admissions. So if you ever need it, and you can email us and we can send it to you. But the example resume um, basically shows everything that you should include on your resume if it applies to you. Um, and for the application review process, there 
they're, um, you know, they're going to look through and you will get reviewed on all of those things. So um, sometimes there are things that you know, you already have a resume and there's things you don't have included on there because you don't think about them in a work sense, but for your education, they make sense. So using that example resume to see what you should include in yours if it applies to you and then just kind of revamping your resume, um, I think helps a lot because sometimes, you know, in admissions, we'll see a resume um, and it's literally just, you know, education, employment background, and that's it. And there's a lot of other things that, you know, volunteer and, um, you know, publish things that have been published, things like that. So I think using that example resume um, and then your essay let your essay be the chance for the review committee to get to know who you are and who you'll be as a practitioner um, because everything else is, is very similar among applicant, applicants. Everybody has to have a GPA above a 3.0. You have to have that one year of already experience. That essay is the chance for them to really get to know who you are and who you'll be as a practitioner and how you'll, um, you know, kind of help your community. So I would say those are the the couple things I usually tell people to really look at um, even when you're first applying, but also if you're reapplying, if you, you know, have been waitlisted or anything like that. Very good advice. And I would say with the essay question, just read through it again and make sure that you've answered the essay prompt. Because sometimes I think we're very passionate about what it is that we're doing and we write about that but it might not go all the way back to that essay prompt. So just being really careful to make sure that you've answered the prompt. Someone had asked if they're, they're in rural area of the Central Coast in California and have we had students get preceptors in Santa Maria area? You know, I can't really speak to that specific area. I'd have to look, but I don't I have not heard of a particular area um, that we couldn't get preceptors. Stephanie, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I saw the question and I was just checking the database because I'm not familiar with the Santa Maria area, but I'm happy to look that up and follow up with you, Margo. Thank you. And yes, um, Mich Mich Michela, I believe it is. Um, we do, the FNU does have federal loans. for tuition. Excellent questions. I'm and one of our financial aid people would be um, more than happy to talk to you about that if you needed to. Yeah, their direct contact information is right on the financial aid section on the website. So um, the financial aid officers are assigned by last name. So you can look on there and see who would be assigned to you. And it's got their email address and their phone number. Very good. And I'm going to advance the slide. We're well, you're welcome to talk about admission questions, um, but we'll also entertain questions about clinical placement or clinicals in general, the acceptance rate. Bobby, do you know that? Um, I do not. That actually has never been shared with me. So I do not know the acceptance rate. I could look into that um, and see if I could find an answer, but I don't have that answer right now. I do not know what the acceptance rate for the FMP program is. I just know no one overall acceptance rate, so I can't speak to that. No, I don't know either. I have a clinical question. Sure. Um, the for the OB clinicals, um, the person that you've you know preset with, what are their requirements? Do you well, know? So your clinicals. Um, the antepartum part, which is what you're talking about, probably you're talking about taking care of pregnant people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so generally that's going to be either an OBGYN or a women's health nurse practitioner or a certified nurse midwife. And um, we have requirements for you to get some antepartum visits, but also to get some women's health visits. So generally speaking, you need about a 120 to 150 hours in women's health in order to meet your visit requirements. Yeah. You're welcome. 
I saw a question um, about the wait list. If you're on the wait list for April 2024, do you need to resubmit your application for the next session or is that done for you? Um, so with the wait list, um, an applicant can be on the wait list two terms. So um, if April 2024 of spring term, that's the first term you've been on the wait list and you do not um, come off the wait list, you will automatically be moved. Well, you'll get an offer to be on the wait list for the summer term. You would get an email. So anytime there's movement like that with your application, um, you'll get an email. Um, so if you do not get admitted for April, then you'll get an email asking if you would like to um, continue being on the wait list for the following term. Um, after two terms of being on the wait list, um, if you have not been admitted, your wait list expires, and then at that time you would need to reapply. Margo's question about the graduation rate. It's good. It's really good, but I can't give you a number. Stephanie, do you know? I may have a link to that from the web page. Let me find it. Yep, I can put it in the chat. Yep. We have all of that on our accreditation website. So general enrollment admissions information or enrollment information, retention information and graduation rates are all listed there. Our graduation rate, um, which really is like our last year retention rate, the, the numbers are very close together is like 90 some percent. I mean, it's very high. We're higher, our retention rate is higher than most online graduate programs across the board. Very good, thank you. Uh, back up to a couple other questions. Angie asked, does years of experience as an RN help with admissions? Yes, it does. Years of experience as an RN um, does, con does uh, contribute to your overall score on your admissions application. And I just wanted to mention, I think our board pass rates for the FNP the last few times have been 98% right in there, 97, 98%. We do have one of the highest pass rates in the country for boards. Yes, we do. Let's see, nursing asked to clarify each application is reviewed at the time it is received. How many times do waitlist persons apply before being accepted? So, Bobby? Um, yeah, I think that really kind of depends on the term you're applying for um, and the timing of when you apply. So, um, because we review applications as they're received, a lot of times wait lists tend to happen more at the, like at the end of an application cycle, once we're coming up on the deadline. Um, but I mean, I, I don't see a lot of people that have to keep reapplying. I've seen people, their wait list expires and, you know, they apply the next time and I've seen them, um, you know, get in after that. But I, I haven't seen something where it's like over and over again or anything like that. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're waitlisted, you've met the requirements. Um, so, you know, if you don't, if you don't get in um, and your waitlist expires, definitely reapply. Absolutely. Um, you know, and reach out and see, um, you know, if there's any suggestions on what you could um, do differently or reach out to, um, I think Stephanie put in the chat that, um, that frontier Facebook group, reach out to other people in there, maybe have somebody go over your essay again, um, you know, that sort of thing. So don't get discouraged if you're waitlisted, because if you're waitlisted, you met the requirements, you know, it, it just might have been full. Right, right. Good answer. And here's another question for you from Tanya. When applying, she has an informatics MSN. Do you need that transcript or the BSN transcript? We need all transcripts related to healthcare. Um, so, yep, so an MSN, um, BSN, uh, Masters of Public Health even, so anything related to healthcare, we would need those transcripts. And if you apply and you don't put one on your proxy form and we see, um, you know, hey, actually, we need this transcript, we'll just let you know. It's not, we wouldn't like kick back your application to you or something. We'll let you know if we need an additional transcript and we'll get that ordered and added to your application file. I would say, Dr. K, for most of our students, it's planning ahead for that travel to the campus. You have that orientation before you start your didactic coursework. So you'll need to plan to be able to travel, have funds for that and have your time off from work or whatever. And then when you come back midway through that program for your clinical bound, you'll have to do that same thing, do the planning. So timing, taking off from work to be able to travel and have four days on campus 
with us. So a lot for our out-of-state and even for our students who live in Kentucky, they just require some pre-planning. But, you know, we have students who are in all all states and, um, you know, if you're ready for an asynchronous online program, it really is nice because there's some flexibility there. You're not time, place, or bound to have to drive to campus three days a week or or whatever. So the flexibility really allows for people who are in rural areas or there's not a program in their area to complete this successfully. And like Dr. Cave said earlier, we've been doing this for decades now. And it's a very, more and more programs are going this direction, especially since the pandemic. And it really seems to work for working nurses who have other commitments in their life. But you have to be able to plan ahead and we can help you with that That's part. That's a really good point. Yeah, very good point. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, look at this picture. This could be you. Success does not come to you, you go to it. And look at those smiles these successful students on their graduation day, and that can be you. Um, we definitely want to see you there. All right. We have another question from Smitty. What does the part-time FMP program time commitment look like? An example schedule. So generally speaking, the way the program of study is um, laid out is that you take two courses per term. We don't really have a part-time program per se, although you can flex it a little bit. So there's some wiggle room. If you want to take one course, thank you, Bobby. If you want to take one course in a term, we can work with you on that. Um, but but it's graduate school and it's tough. So um, when when I think here part time, there really isn't a, a part time option, but we are flexible. So the example might be that you take two courses in one term. And if you know that your life is getting busy in the next term, you can go down to one course. And then in the next term, we might bump back up to two courses. You'll work through all of that with your professional advisor when you're a student here and they can help you map that out, just like Stephanie was talking about planning ahead, map that out and help create a program of study that works with you, but also still stays within the parameters and the guidelines of the program. And, and I, I'll just wanna kind of segue onto that, Dr. Cave, because, you know, Frontier knows that things happen in your life. Um, you know, parents get ill, children get ill, you get ill. And sometimes you have to take a step back from your studies and realize that you need to take care of yourself or your family. And so they work with you on that. Your advisors will work with you on that. But we know things happen. Um, you know, we don't want you to think that you come into this program and you have to be, you know, if you have a major crisis that you're going to not be able to complete the program. We work with you very hard to make sure that we um, try to either give you an academic hiatus or an emergency hiatus or something. But the issue is, is that sometimes people don't reach out and let us know they have a problem. And then we see them struggling in their courses and they get an F in a course and they get another F and then they're, you know, now they're at risk of being kicked out of the program. You know, we don't want that to happen. So, you know, if you come into the program and you have issues going on, you need to reach out to your faculty, your advisor, let them know so we can help you to work through some of those problems. And, you know, Frontier is all about you being uh, and your you and your family. I mean, they're they're important. And that's what what we think. So just so you know that. Angie, I love your question. Can single moms be successful in this program? And I'm going to say yes, yes, and yes. Oh, um, yeah, definitely. We have many, I mean, you know, students come from across the country from all different um, backgrounds and, and things in, in Frontier um, really is committed to their students. So the fact that you might be a single parent um, should not stand in the way of you getting your education and Frontier 
walks that walk and talks that talk and believes in that. Mm -hmm. The caveat to that is staying involved with your faculty, keeping them up to date on what's going on. And if you feel like you're struggling with something, then reach out because Frontier has flexible options. The earlier they're asked for, the better. So a resounding yes, single parents can be successful in this program. And we love that part. Thank you. I was just, um, I have been thinking a lot about going back to school. I just have one, you know, little girl, she's seven. Um, I'm more than willing to go part-time. I have, you know, 18 years of nursing experience. I have the drive. I just need to know that this has been done. There's resources for it me. It has been done. There so, are. <laughs> it's yes. kind of a big step and I don't. It is. You know, it is. And I'm so happy that you're um, ready to make that step that they should be really proud of yourself for that. Um, Thank you. Yes, we are very committed to our students, but we it's a two way street too. like, we have to hear from you and we have to know if something's not going well. And okay. as far as your work schedule, like make sure you talk to your professional advisor and make sure you talk about that at Frontier Bound, because it may be more important for you to decrease your work schedule once you get into clinical. Like you might okay. be able to work through the didactic program and not have to change your work schedule. It just depends on what it is. Okay. And I, okay, I Angie, I have someone that was in my course a few terms ago that was single, went through a divorce and had three children and she did beautifully. So it, oh, def wow. it definitely can be done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, I've been a single mom for, you know, a few years now and it's quite the adjustment, but I think we've got it down and I really, I really want to do this, but I just need to know that I have the resources well, if needed. I, I was a single mom with three teenagers and I did my FNP program and it wasn't easy, but I did it and I never regretted it. So do it. Okay. <laughs> I was yeah, just going to say that I feel like all of our fact that a lot of our faculty have experienced the same yep. thing so they understand what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. This has been a great discussion. You've had some great questions. Um, here are some email addresses. If you want to take a picture of this slide, you have any other questions about admissions or clinical or financial aid. We're happy to get those emails from you and answer your questions. Um, and as Stephanie said in the chat, we do look forward to seeing you um, at a future Frontier Bound and uh, very excited to be able to share some of this information with you tonight. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you.